My name is Rob McNeely. I'm a medical, medically trained person. I was in general medical practice in Melbourne, Australia for 10 years. And I got interested in hypnosis and had the, the pleasure and privilege of spending some time with Milton Erickson in the last few years of his life. And um, I'd learned about hypnosis and found it intriguing. Uh, but the program that I learned hypnosis in was a really very conservative uh, association. And after two or three years learning with them, I, I'd learned that hypnosis was very complex and pretty dangerous. And I, I don't know, that was, it was still fascinating, but that didn't seem like it was enough to... Uh, Get, keep my interest for a long time. And when I met Milton Erickson, there was a whole range of changes that happened to me. It really transformed my whole attitude to hypnosis and therapy in general. And um, so in this, in this talk, I want to share with you, uh, we have about an hour, I want to share with you some of the for me, most important and crucial and useful uh, aspects of what Ericsson was inviting us into, just in case that, that exploring this together might add to your interest and into your maybe effectiveness in your work. And uh, uh, also to add to your confidence and your, your sense of personal well-being. So uh, when I started learning about hypnosis, uh, I thought that it was, it was somehow, there was a metaphor that was used that was very close to anesthesia, like giving someone an anesthetic. So the idea was that you put someone under, you had them go deeper, and then when they were thoroughly anesthetized or hypnotized or entranced, then you did some kind of uh, psychological, emotional surgery. So you removed any unwanted thoughts, feelings or behaviours and you substituted those with some kind of uh, prosthetic preferred thoughts, feelings or behaviours. And so the, the, in, in that paradigm, where I'm the expert, I'm giving the anaesthetic and I'm the surgeon, I'm going to do the work, the focus is on me. And I'd better know my stuff, I'd better be pretty expert and I'd better really know what I'm doing because I'm the most important person here. I'm like if, if a, someone is having a surgical operation, the surgeon is the person who's on the job there. They need to know what they're doing. They're, the spotlight is on them to do the right thing, otherwise everyone's in trouble. But after I'd spent some time with Milton Erickson, I became intrigued with, with an idea that he presented when he talked about the common everyday trance. When we read a book or watch a movie or uh, walk in nature, we get in something that, that happens to anyone in an everyday experience, then we find ourselves focusing on whatever we're doing and we get absorbed in that experience and time passes and we forget about uh, what we were doing and we give less attention to our body, our past, our future. We're just absorbed in what we're doing. So when, when Erickson spoke about the common everyday trance, it gave us the um, possibility of thinking of hypnosis, not as some weird and uh, alien uh, experience, but rather as an extension of that common everyday trance. So then instead of trying to define hypnosis, and if you, if you read textbooks and look for a definition of hypnosis, you'll find that there's not a lot of agreement. In fact, there's, a, there's mostly disagreement. Is it a state? Is it, does it exist? 
is everything hypnosis? Is nothing hypnosis? There's a wide variety of definitions. So instead of that, my preference is to, instead of define and pin it down, to have a description of something. And so I like to think of hypnosis descriptively as an experience where there is focus and absorption that we can mutually agree on as hypnosis. So that way hypnosis with the word is a descriptor. It doesn't define anything. In the same way that we can all know what a chair is. But uh, if, we try and, if we try and explore, is this chair comfortable? There is no way of defining comfort. You get one chair and put one person in it and they say, this chair is so soft and comfortable. And another person will sit in the same chair and, this, and they'll say, this is, chair is too soft, it's uncomfortable. So comfort is not a function of the chair. It's a matter of assessment, a matter of general agreement. So then if we think of hypnosis and start from a description as an experience, where there's focus and absorption that we can agree on as hypnosis, then if someone uh, drifts off in while we're having a counseling session and they say, oh, did you hypnotize me? We can, uh, we can explore what they mean by that. Uh, you were focused on something, you got absorbed in it. Would you call that hypnosis? I might call it hypnosis. And if I say, I think it was hypnosis, and they say, I don't think it was hypnosis, then it wasn't. If I say, I don't think it was hypnosis, I think you were just uh, daydreaming, and they say, I think it was hypnosis, then we can't really agree on it being hypnosis. So instead of tying it down and, and having an argument about whether it really is hypnosis or whether it really isn't hypnosis, if we stick with that description. That way, we can start to explore the use of hypnosis um, in a more ordinary, everyday uh, uh, way so that it makes it more available to, to people, it makes it more approachable, less fearful, more acceptable, and it takes the pressure off us too. The second principle that, that, that I want to speak about that, that is really at the center of Ericsson's invitation is the idea that people are individuals. People are different. He said, no two people have the same fingerprints. Every person our fingerprints are as individual as we are. And to think that there could be one form of therapy, one approach, one protocol, one method that can be useful and relevant for all people of both genders, of all ages, of all ethnic backgrounds, of all situations is ridiculous. So instead of trying to find an overarching method, theory, or approach, after Ericsson, the invitation is to see who this person is. What's their experience? And that leads us to the question of how can this person go into hypnosis? What would be useful for this person to have happen in the counseling, in the hypnosis session? So instead of us having the answer and being the expert, it shifts the focus from us as the performer and it shifts the focus onto the client as the most important source of experience, of learning, of finding the solutions that, that, that are going to be relevant for, for them. Um, Erickson said that we can be always totally confident that every client 
has all the resources they need to resolve their problem. Now, when you first hear that, it might sound rather obvious, but actually it's a revolutionary idea to think that every person has the solution to their problem. He then went on to say that when someone comes with to therapy, they always bring their solution with them. Only they don't know that they bring their solution with them. So have a very nice time talking with your client, helping them to, helping them to find the solution that they brought that they didn't know that they brought. So I was totally charmed by that. Again, it shifted the focus on me and my performance and my supposed expertise. And it shifted it from that onto the client and what, what might be helpful for them. When I first heard that, as I say, I was totally charmed by it. I, I really liked it. But I was left with the dilemma of, okay, if someone comes with a problem and they bring their solution, they don't know, it, help them to find it. But how do you do that? How do we help someone to find something that they don't know how to find? And of course, some people just making an appointment to see us start some kind of process and they, they start to resolve their issue before they even get to see us. I remember one, one, one day my first client was a couple and uh, the husband said, last night my wife told me that we had an appointment to see you. And I said to her, what are we seeing him for? And she said to me, well, we haven't been communicating. And the husband said, what do you mean? What haven't we been communicating about? And they sat down and they had a long conversation for a couple of hours. And they had all of the conversations and communicated about all the things that they hadn't been communicating about. So they arrived at nine o'clock and the husband tells me this. And so I thanked him for coming, taking the time to come and see me to tell me that he didn't need to be there. So they had the solution that they, they brought to their, uh, their problem. And they, they resolved that simply by making an appointment and having a conversation about it. Nothing to do with me. But not everybody does that, of course. And then how do we help someone to look within their experience to find what, what, what's missing for them, what they want, what, what would be helpful so that the problem could be resolved. And after some rummaging around and exploring and a lot of conversations, it started to become clear to me that when any of us do something that we like to do, whether it's reading a book, walking in nature, riding a bicycle, spending time with the family, uh, being in the garden, uh, whatever it is, if we like doing something, then we have all of the resources that we need right at the tips of our fingers. So that if something happens, for example, uh, I like gardening. And if I'm gardening and, uh, and I get a scratch like I did, I've got a scratch on my arm here because last week I was gardening and I got scratched by a rose. So that happened. But it was like, oh, okay, well, I'll get a tissue and mop up the blood and uh, put a tissue, put a band-aid on and then get back into the garden. It wasn't a problem. It was just an, a glitch, just an, a temporary in, interruption to the pleasurable activity of being in the garden. My eldest son is a very keen cyclist. He gets out of bed early in the morning and goes for a bicycle ride, sometimes for an hour. 
and he likes it. He likes it a lot. But if he's riding and he falls off, or the chain comes off, or it starts to rain, or he gets thirsty or hungry, he doesn't go and have therapy. He just gets off the bike, he just gets back on the bike, or he puts the chain back on, or he puts a jacket on, or he has something to eat or drink. Those kind of interruptions are things that he can handle easily, almost pleasurably. They are not a significant interruption. They're not a problem. They're just something that he deals with. So when any of us do something that we like to do, we find ourselves in a resourceful state where pretty well anything that happens is, shows up as to us as something that we can deal with. So if we, if we can ask a, a, a client, ask a person, what do you like to do? Uh, then that provides an opportunity to explore what Erickson spoke of as the common everyday trance. We can ask someone to imagine or remember riding their bicycle, being in the garden, reading a pleasurable book. We can invite them to start to focus on some part of that and then to become absorbed in that experience. And then if we watch, we can see certain physiological changes that are so often associated with the hypnotic experience. Whenever we get focused and absorbed, whenever you watch someone going into hypnosis, you'll see certain changes frequently, almost inevitably, something happens to their eyelids. They start to blink more slowly. Some people, even when you say, what do you like to do? Uh, oh, I like to go swimming. And they actually close their eyes as they start to recall that experience. So there can be changes in their eyelids. Usually when we get focused and absorbed in any experience, reading a book, thinking about something pleasurable, the, we have a, an increased stillness in our body. The movements are lessened and sometimes we become quite immobile. So these are changes that we can look for and also in the facial configuration. Sometimes we, when we're reading a book or getting absorbed in something, I'll see if I can overact here, if you can watch my face. We can be doing something and then as we get absorbed in it, there's a kind of a, everything kind of smooths out. Also, if you can see someone's breathing, very often when a person is focused and absorbed, their breathing slows down and becomes just a little deeper. So if we, for example, ask someone to remember or recall or imagine they're doing something they like to do, then invite them to become focused on some part of that, become absorbed in that to whatever degree they do, and then look and see those, look for those changes, expect to see them, and comment on them. When we comment on those changes, those comments serve to reassure the, and ratify for that person that something is happening. Then if someone, if we can follow along, if you will accept my, my description of, of hypnosis as focus, absorbed experience that we agree on, if we can get someone to focus and get absorbed in something they like to do, we have all the precursors, all the, the elements that are going to lead into a hypnotic experience. Whether it's recognized, acknowledged as hypnosis or not, is way less important than the fact that it generates an experience. 
And in particular, that experience when someone is doing something that they like to do, that experience is going to be an experience that is full of resources. Pretty well anything that we were looking for. So before we ask someone to get into the experience of, of what they like to do, we can find out from them by asking what's missing for you? What do you want from this experience? What would be helpful for you if we could do something here that would be useful? If we can find out what it is that we're looking for, what's missing for this person, then that's going to make it a lot easier to find it. My Irish ancestors say that if you don't know where you're going, you might end up in a different place. And so if we're doing some therapy to help someone, it's going to make a huge difference if we know what they're looking for, what we are looking for together. If I go into the supermarket, like I did earlier today, and my wife said to me, could you get some particular, some shredded cheese and, uh, and some, um, what was the other thing she asked me to get? Some, oh, a brown onion. She wanted a brown onion and some shredded cheese. So I go into the supermarket and I know where the brown onion is, brown onions are, so I pick one up. I know where the shredded cheese is, so I go there and get a packet of shredded cheese and I'm out of there in a few minutes. If I went into that supermarket not knowing what I was there for, I could be there for hours, wandering around, wondering, do I want this or do I want that or this or that? I might come across what I'm looking for, it's a possibility, but if I know what I'm looking for, I go, I get it, and I'm out of there. So in the same way with a client, if they can find, and if we can help them to find out what it is that they're looking for, what they're shopping for in the supermarket, if what they're looking for in their uh, problem, that if they had it, they'd be okay, then we know what we're looking for. So if we know where to look, the, what someone likes to do because that's where the resources are and we know what we're looking for we found out what's missing for them that's a pretty good combination so then we can invite someone let's get into this experience that you like to do let's get focused get some absorption comment about the changes and we know what we're looking for so we can we can ask this person in their in their experience of doing what they like to do, to look for that experience with it, that's missing in the problem and look for it in their lives. For example, if someone says, I feel anxious when I fly in a plane and I like reading a book and what's missing for me is feeling comfortable on a plane. I'm just making this up. If that's what's missing, comfort, we can ask someone, well, let's read a book. Remember, get into the experience, start to focus, get absorbed, make comments. And now you're in the experience of reading a book. Notice how, as you're reading, how comfortable you are feeling. And because someone likes reading a book, they're not going to say, oh, I don't feel comfortable reading a book. They're going to feel comfortable. Or if what's missing for, a, for being in a plane is a feeling of safety. Well, read your book and notice how it is to feel safe. If the issue in, in flying in a plane is trusting the pilot, then in reading a book, this person can very easily Notice what it's like to trust the chair they're sitting in, the book that they're holding, the hands, their hands that are holding the book, their eyes to, to read what's there, their understanding to make sense of it. There's a lot of trust there. So then there's an opportunity for us to 
um, look with that person. for exactly what's missing in the problem and look for it in their likes. And once we find it, we can invite them to sit with that, to get, get familiar with it, to kind of soak it up, to learn it. And then once we do that, very often clients start to spontaneously make a connection. Uh, more often, we have to help them uh, that they can feel comfortable or safe or trusting reading a book. How can we help them to bring that to flying on the plane? And there are a couple of steps that I'm that I could uh, offer. One is to just say that they're the same. Flying in a plane is like reading a book. Now, first, uh, first view of that, that sounds like a crazy thing to say. But we humans are sense-making machines. When someone says something, however ridiculous or absurd, we want to make sense of it. So sometimes uh, when we say that flying in a plane is like reading a book, some people will say, oh, okay, oh, I can just do that often need more, we can say, what is it about reading a book that could be relevant and helpful for you in flying in a plane? When we ask that question, we can expect some very strange answers. Uh, the, the answers might be, uh, for example, to um, think of something else, to uh, just ignore what I'm thinking about, uh, people come up with their own idea um, and but make their connection. Uh, other times it's helpful to talk about learning. That when you first learn to fly in a plane, you may, have, I'm sorry, when you first learn to read a book, you may have felt uncomfortable, you may have felt um, uh, that you didn't Trust yourself to read the letters, to read the words. They didn't quite make sense. You didn't feel safe when you first started to read the book because someone might laugh at you or you might make a mistake. But then as you learned to read a book, as you were reading, you started to learn that and you started to settle into that. And now you not only can feel comfortable or safe, or trusting, but you can actually enjoy it. So in the same way that you learned how to read a book, you can learn how to fly in a plane. And when we bring learning in like that, it helps to shift the experience from, uh, oh, now you're okay, just get it and get out of here. Just, um, make the connection, otherwise there's something wrong with you. Instead of it having to happen like, whoosh, happen, let's do it now, it transforms that, that experience into a process like learning. It can happen over time. It takes the pressure off the client, takes the pressure off us, and we can further reduce the pressure off everybody by, by offering the idea that 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 connection doesn't have to happen here in this session. It doesn't have to happen now. Maybe when you're eating your breakfast tomorrow or, or watching television next week, or you're walking to work, or you're going to sleep, or you have a dream, and, some, and that, can, that connection can just happen without you even knowing that it's going to happen and then discover afterwards that it has. So all of those ways of, of helping to connect the missing resource from the likes into the problem area, they offer, that's a range of possibilities that we can do that. Um, 
then after we've done that, we can ask someone what's different. And it's lovely when someone comes out of trance to say, what's, what's different now? And you get a variety of responses. Some people say, oh, I feel okay, like they're cured. Some people say, oh, I feel a little bit better. So that lets us know what we can do more of. Or someone might say, I feel a bit worse. Well, that lets us know uh, what we can do less of. And if someone says, oh, actually, I don't feel any different, then that gives us a chance to re examine the whole process and, and look and see what else might be missing, what else might be useful. So there's um, uh, a, a, a sort of a series of questions that, that I've, I've found and I'm inviting you to explore. Um, I've, written, I've written that, that down in a free little ebook called Easy Guide to Easy Hypnosis and if you're interested to have that, um, have some reminder of that, just send me an email. My email is just rob, R-O-B, at C-E-T dot net dot A-U, and I'll be happy to send it to you. Now, what I wanted to do, you know, I've been talking for a while, about half an hour, and I think half an hour is a lot of time for you to be listening to someone going blah, blah, blah. Now, so, so that this makes some sense, I, I thought I would um, invite anyone who's interested into an experience so that we can play with this and you can try it on as an experience yourself and see what you make of it. See if it is it helpful for you, if there's some parts of this that are relevant to you, so that you can make use of, that you can copy, you can alter, find your own translation of then as an experience, it's something that you might be able to do more of rather than just listening to my, me speaking about, all, about this all the time. So if you're interested in doing that, um, on my email, someone's asked, it's rob, R-O-B, at C-E-T dot net dot A-U. Um, <clears throat> I'll put, I'll put, um, I'll put something on the chat there. I'll put that on the chat so that everybody can see it. Uh, let me look here. Sorry, I'm being a little bit, oh, here we go. Oh, huh, chat. It was there and I didn't see it. Someone has asked in the chat, I wonder about asking the magical, que magical question under hypnosis. Um, the, uh, the, the brief therapy people like to call that the miracle question. And um, uh, when we ask the miracle question, you know, if a miracle happened and the, you wake up and the, while you're asleep and you wake up and the problem's gone, what would be different? What would be different Oh, thanks. Someone's put my email there on the chat. What would be different when the problem's not there after the miracles happen is what's missing when the problem is there. So thanks for that, that idea. Asking the miracle question, the magic question is a way of um, finding what's missing. Now, um, so if, if you're interested and um, if you're not interested in participating in this you don't need to you could just listen to what i'm saying and, and see what you make of it as an idea maybe some take some notes if that would if you would prefer that otherwise um you can you can see what happens when you respond to the question and now i, I won't know what what your experience is so this is just an opportunity to play and i want to emphasize that i'm not guaranteeing that that this process is going to be useful to you. It's likely to be. I don't think it's ever been harmful to anyone. As far as I'm aware, no one has ever died from it. But um, you might be the first, but I think most people find that it's pretty easy and, and usually quite helpful. So you can play, go along with, with my invitation to respond to the questions. 
my invitations to have the experience, or you can just listen on and maybe think about what I'm saying, or even note down some of the questions that you might want to play with yourself. So first of all, my invitation is for anyone who's interested to think of something that's been a problem to you. Think of something that's been an, uh, a nuisance, uh, something that's got in the way, something that you'd like to do something about. You can just think about that for a moment. And then could, could you also reflect on what, how come that's a problem to you? What is it specifically about that problem that is really problematic to you? Then I'd like to ask you, what do you like to do? What is it that you've been doing recently that you find yourself thinking, oh, I wish I could do more of this? What is it that gives you pleasure? What is it that you enjoy? What is it that when you do it, you feel more yourself, more of who and how you want to be? And then if you could think about what that is that you like to do and just have the thought, the question, your response to what is it about that? When you're doing what you like to do, what do you like about that? And just sit with that for a moment. Now, if you come back to the problem, could you just be curious with me, curious with, within yourself, what's missing for you that if you had it, you'd be okay. That problem wouldn't be a problem anymore. If there was something that you could do or think or feel, a different way of being, different way of responding, what would that be so that that problem would no longer be a problem? And if you can just take a moment to sit with that question, what is this that's missing for you? If a miracle happened, and at the end of this time, you find that the problem's no longer a problem, what would be happening for you? And whatever that is, that's what we're going to go looking for. So then with all of that, and you don't need to follow along in any linear sequential way, you can find yourself moving backwards and forwards through those questions in any random way. You can listen to my words or let my back, my voice be a noise in the background, but maybe just pay attention to your own thinking. It really doesn't matter. So if you can allow yourself to begin to connect with whatever you identified as something that you like to do, whatever that is, and you, you could remember some time in the recent past where that was happening, or you could imagine that, you could recall that, you could pretend that, you could look forward to that. Whatever way you can begin to clarify for yourself that experience. And then if you would, allow yourself to begin to focus on some part of that experience. It might be something that you see or hear or sense or feel. Or it might be something different. It really doesn't matter. And you might even find that your focus begins to meander from this to that, this time to that time, to this experience to that. You do not need to keep your focus in any particular way. Just let it go wherever it goes. And then as a natural consequence of focusing in the way that you are, can you allow yourself to become even more absorbed than you probably already have begun 
to. And allow that absorption to be to whatever degree it happens to be. You might find that as this experience continues, you become more and more absorbed. Or you might find yourself becoming more absorbed and then thinking, uh, what am I going to do about this uh, thing tomorrow? Or you, know, you might become absorbed in something completely irrelevant. So the absorption can vary. That really doesn't matter. Just allow yourself to be as absorbed as you happen to be. And then, as you are in th this experience, which of course is your experience, not mine, is happening in you, not in me, and is a function of you, not of me. As you are in this experience, I'm inviting you to look around in the experience to find whatever you identified as being missing for you that had that problem be problematic, whatever that was. And just look around in the experience that you are focused and absorbed in to whatever degree that you are. Look around in this and expect to find what it is that you're looking for. And when you do that, and take your time to do that, there's no hurry. When you find it, my invitation is to allow yourself to sit with it, to just sit with it for a time, to get to know it, to attend to it to become even more familiar with it than you already are. So that you can really soak it up, really learn it. And then I'm going to uh, make a comment that might sound a little strange. And you don't have to respond in any particular way. But what I'm going to say is that that problem that you identified is the same as the experience that you like. They're the same. I'm not asking you to agree with me. All I'm asking, all I'm inviting you to do is to be in that experience of looking at that, sensing that, in case it makes some sense to you. And I can also invite you, as you continue to be in your experience of whatever it is that you like, to begin to wonder, what is it about this experience that I like, that I'm enjoying? that could be useful, that could be helpful and relevant in dealing with that problem. What could be helpful here? How could what I'm doing in my life be something that would be useful for me, would make a difference to me? And again, I'm inviting you to sit with that for a moment, not be in any hurry about it, and I want to remind you that when you first started, whatever it is that you like to do now, when you first started that, it may not have been easy. It may have even seemed impossible. It's very likely to have been difficult. But somehow you learned. And as you learnt that, all of those difficulties and problems that you had somehow fell away and you were able to not only do that and be in that, but even enjoy it. 
And so I'm offering the idea that in the same way that you learned how to do whatever it is that you like, in that same way, you can learn how to connect what was missing with the problem and learn how to do that and get the benefit of that. And I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm not saying that what I'm saying is correct. I'm simply inviting you to be present to that possibility. And also to just remind us all that this connection doesn't need to happen in this exercise, doesn't have to happen in this call, in this presentation. It can happen sometime in the future, some place other than where you are at the moment, in a way that perhaps you couldn't even anticipate. But nevertheless, it can happen. So, I've been talking for a while, and my invitation is for you to just sit with what's happening for you at the moment, whatever that happens to be, to just sit with that. And as you're doing that, to let all of that settle. And then after a time, and you know when, it might take a few seconds, it might take a minute, when you're ready, to let your attention be more as it was before I invited you into this, to perhaps be more aware of your surroundings, more aware that you're on a call, you're, that we're in this conference together. <clears throat> and uh, then I'm, I have a question, <clears throat> final question for you. What do you notice is different now than when we started that exercise? What's different? And it's not important to find anything specific. It might be very obvious, or it might, you might have a hint of it, or it might, might seem that nothing is different at all. None of that's important. All I was doing was inviting all of us into an exercise and an experience to explore something. And I'm wondering if it's okay. Would anyone want to, we have a few minutes left before we're due to stop. If, does anyone have anything that they might want to comment about, to, to share, to speak about? And if you do that, could you, um, could you turn on your video and unmute yourself so that then we can see you and hear you? and I'll have a chance to respond to what you might have to say. So, has anyone got anything that they might want to comment about or share or, or any questions that anyone might want to ask? The other option, of course, is to, um, to make a comment in the chat so we can all see that. So you can either write something in the chat, ask a question in the chat, or unmute yourself and turn on your, your um, turn on your video, uh, your, your camera, so that we can see you. Now there are a number of people on this call, so if you are going to unmute yourself and you want to say something, and you do, you you unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Also, <laughs> might be a good idea if you uh, make a comment in the chat so that I know where to look for you, so that I know who's talking. So, what's different? What do you, what do you notice? What do you make about that? What do you think? Anything useful there? Anything different to comment? Someone's got something there. I heard a noise. Oy, Jim, have you got to say something? Yes, and I felt 
I felt a little bit uh, re relaxed, and uh, uh, suddenly I I fall into a uh, kind of you know I'm not I'm I was not here, and uh -huh. uh, some some scenery appears, and um, um there are there are that big trees, and there is a rabbit, and I'm I'm it seems that I was ch chasing a rabbit, okay. and uh, <laughs> yeah. And that, is that okay? Did you enjoy that? Yeah, I enjoyed it very much, and mm -hmm. I felt so comfortable. And uh, mm -hmm. I feel that there there's something uh, more into my body, although I don't know what it is. Yeah, maybe it will the change will happen in the future. Uh, yeah, that's very nice. Favorite. So there's something that you feel relaxed, and the, the, those those trees and that rabbit that you were chasing came out of you. I didn't say anything about trees or rabbits or relax. And you're more in your yeah, body. Yeah. And you're not quite sure how that, but could that be helpful for you in the future to be more in your body? Yeah, sort of strength, maybe. More strange. Okay. Yeah, strength. Strange. So it would, but would it be helpful if that, if are there some situations where it would be good for you beneficial for you to be more in your body but that'd be helpful for you yeah i know it would be for me for most of us i think yeah the, the invitation is to just be open to that and be interested to, to now that you've had that experience to wonder how that can inform you how that can be helpful and you don't need to know beforehand so thank you so much for sharing that your experience I'm glad it was. Thank useful. you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Jim. Any other comments? So Nancy in, in the chat has said, I feel like something is possible that I thought was not possible. Oh, my goodness. That sounds good. Good. Thank you, Nancy. Any other comments that anyone has to say? Feel hope. Okay. Very good. We can do with more of that. Feel more hope. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. So is there anything that, that you experienced or that you heard me talk about or invited you into that you can start to incorporate into your work? Is there anything in, in this time together that you can think, oh, I could do that. I could, I could play with that. Because that's my invitation. You know, after, we've, after this call is finished, I'll go my way, I've got some things to do, you'll go do what you're going to do, and we'll go on with our life. So it's, it's, it's not, I'm not the important person here, it's just I'm offering some ideas so that there's a possibility of you thinking, ah, oh, I could play with that, I might be able to include some of that. In particular, my strong invitation is for you to give more time to asking people about what they like to do. That was totally new to me. I, I never, never used to focus on that. It was all about, tell me about the problem. And when we talk about, we ask someone about what they like to do, my wife talks about it like this. She says that when a person comes, they have a problem. And when we talk about what they like to do, the person is a problem. So there's more of the person there and the problem becomes more diminished and more manageable. So I'd invite you all to play with the idea of starting a session with 
what do you like to do? Whether you're going to use some hypnosis or not, just asking what someone likes to do can, can shift the whole context of a therapy session. Talking about problems can make any of us uh, feel, ugh. The, the mood gets heavy. Someone wants me to talk about rapid hypnosis. Uh, I, my invitation is for you to, um, not for me to show you how to do rapid hypnosis, but for you to experience the, the way you can go into hypnosis and just go into that and become familiar with it. Um, because the more familiar we are with something, the quicker we can get to that. When I first, coming back to the supermarket that I go to, when I first went into that supermarket, I didn't know where anything was. But as I mentioned, I wanted to get an, an onion, a brown onion. I know where they are. Um, I wanted to get some shredded cheese. I know where the cheese is. So after I got to know the layout of that, that supermarket, it was quicker. So in the same way, if you want to be, go into hypnosis uh, more quickly, all you need to do is to become more familiar with it. It's, it's, it's something that happens with practice. And uh, Linda Howe has written the reminder that the client brings the solution. Yeah, and that, I think that that's, that's it's so important that, that, that we are reminded of that. Okay. Yeah, and uh, someone said here the combination of mindfulness with the miracle question. And people say, is, is mindfulness a form of hypnosis? Is hypnosis like mindfulness? And for me, I like to think of hypnosis, as I say, as, a, as an experience with focus and absorption that we call hypnosis. And mindfulness is an experience where this focus and absorption that we call mindfulness and meditation is an experience with focus and absorption that we call uh, meditation hypnosis i've been talking talk to medical students and said that hypnosis is like mindfulness with a gps mindfulness focuses on being present hypnosis starts by being present and then invites us in the, after Ericsson invites us into a direction towards a solution. So, um, but it's, it's good to see the connection. They're, they're both, they both, in, they both generate an experience. They both are involved focus and they both involve absorption. It's just how we use it. How we do that. So thanks for that comment. All right, well, um, our hour is up. So all that it remains for me to do is to thank you all for being willing to be in this rather weird experience of having 20 or 30 people, all with, some with blank screens and some with names and some with still pictures and listen to me going blah, 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 blah for an hour. Thank you for being willing to, to be present to that and Thank you for, for uh, being willing to find something in, in our time together that can be useful. And I'd love to hear from you. If there's something that you want to connect with me, uh, ask a question or I'll ask more about resources or what, um, send me an email, that'd be a pleasure. So let's finish and thank you again for your company and for the pleasure of sharing this work with you. Bye for now.